Special purpose acquisition companies, SPACs to their friends, are curious creatures. These so-called blank check companies can be the lifeline needed to help a startup get on the right track to becoming a fully-fledged sustainable business. But all too often, especially in the EV world, blank check companies seem to do little more than delay the inevitable, keeping a company alive like a zombie cicada, allowing them to go through their life with the impression that maybe one day things will be normal, but all too often ending in the company's demise. Sometimes SPACs can work, but other times, as soon as the initial stock market hype has died down, well... Yeah, and if you watch this channel enough, you will know that we're all pretty wary of startup EV companies getting onto the stock market via a SPAC reverse merger. While it's generally easier for a company to enter onto the stock market via a SPAC than it is through the traditional initial public offering, since the rules over SPAC acquisitions are a lot less complicated and stringent than they are for a regular IPO, the risk to investors is far, far higher. Nevertheless, SPACs are now the default way for automakers to enter onto the stock market. In fact, aside from Tesla, Rivian and Akimoto, pretty much every other electric automaker or EV startup we can think of has joined the stock market via a SPAC. One such company, Lordstown Motors, went public via a SPAC reverse merger just under two years ago, championed by then-President Donald Trump as being a company working to bring back manufacturing jobs to America, Lordstown once promised it would offer the first electric pickup truck on the market in the form of the Lordstown Endurance. Even as its founder floundered under allegations that he and the CFO had made false statements about the number of pre-orders the truck had received, the company maintained it would be the first to market. Until, that is, Rivian pipped it to the post last autumn. With the production endurance still missing in action, Rivian R1T deliveries are well underway, and Ford readying itself to begin deliveries of the hundreds of F-150 Lightnings it's already produced, Lordstown posted a 90 million US dollar first quarter loss at the start of this week. Then, yesterday, confirmed that a deal to sell its production facility to Foxconn had been finalised, potentially changing the company's futures for the better. But will Lordstown finally get the break it needs? Or is it doomed to fail? Sadly, I think it's the latter. Before I explain why, I'm going to come out and say it. This video is made possible because people like you have hit subscribe, tapped the bell icon, and tweaked your personal YouTube preferences to make sure that you are told that every video we make is live. Sure, I know I'm not as gifted as Kate with the song references, despite being a music major, but I do know a bunch of weird obscure stuff that makes our videos a little different compared to the rest because, well, off-topic rambles are fun. And I think you like that. And I also think that we'd like it if you'd consider supporting the channel from just one doll hair per month. I'll tell you how at the end of the video. Please don't actually send us doll hairs. Oh, and yeah, if you've not looked into zombie cicadas, you totally should. Without going full entomologist on you, they're basically periodical cicadas that have been infected with a particular parasitic psychedelic fungus that takes over the cicada's normal behaviour by pumping amphetamines into their body, <laughs> yay mind control, and turns what would normally be healthy reproductive organs into what one scientist colourfully called a, quote, fungal plug. Sometimes the infinite possibilities in infinite combinations of the natural world really amazes me. We really do need to look after this little pale blue dot a little better, don't we? Anyway, back to the video. The future of Lordstown. And in order to understand where it is today, let's give ourselves a quick refresher of where it was. And because we've covered Lordstown before, I'm not going to bother going back to cover the company's roots and, and its ties to the workhorse group. Instead, I'm just going to look back at the tail end of last year, and I'll link below to our more in-depth history dive in the description. 
Shortly after its original CEO resigned, Lordstown Motors went through something of a restructuring. It confirmed in September last year that it wouldn't actually make the endurance at the Lordstown, Ohio production facility it purchased from General Motors for 40 million US dollars. Instead, it said it wanted to sell the factory to Taiwanese electronics manufacturer Foxconn, Equipment et al., and then contract Foxconn to produce the Lordstown endurance on its behalf. Then, Sometime during the fourth quarter last year, General Motors, which had acquired 7.5 million shares of Lordstown as part of Lordstown SPAC merger in 2020, sold all of its stake in the startup. GM had originally become an investor in Lordstown Motors when it sold its former production facility to use the fledgling company for 40 million and also loaned Lordstown the money it needed to make the purchase. So when GM cut its losses and dumped the stock. It wasn't exactly a surprise, but it wasn't exactly good news for Lordstown either. However, Lordstown's decision to sell off its production facility and license production to someone else allowed it to offload some of the risks associated with starting up a brand new production line and all of the financial burdens that go with it. Earlier this week, when Lordstown announced its $90 million first quarter loss, its stock fell to $1.55, a fraction of the $10 and some per share it commanded when it entered onto the stock market via a SPAC reverse merger in 2020. That drop in share price was partly due to its losses, but also due to the looming deadline by which the sale of the Lordstown plant to Foxconn needed to be completed. Since Foxconn had made approximately $200 million in down payments on the production facility to Lordstown, had the deal fallen through, Lordstown would have been on the hook and forced to pay the funds already received from Foxconn. And if you're already $90 million in debt, adding another $200 million on top would have been a very bad day. Especially since on Monday, Lordstown said it required an additional $150 million in capital in order to begin series production of the Endurance. Yep, on Monday it said it didn't have enough money to actually begin production of the vehicle that it said it was going to start producing and selling last year. So this news that the sale has now been completed is in fact amazing news for Lordstown. It's in fact some of the best news it's received for more than a year. Sure, it may end up paying more for each vehicle made, but it doesn't have to worry about the financial burden of setting up a production facility using money it patently doesn't have. And Foxconn, which has wanted to get into the automotive manufacturing game for a really long time, gets a fully functional facility in the US that it can use to produce vehicles. In fact, with the deal now final, Foxconn hasn't wasted any time getting new customers for that production facility. Fisk announced yesterday it had reached a deal with Foxconn to use that newly acquired production facility to produce the Fisker Pair, the second model that Fisker hopes to bring to market, even though its first isn't in production yet. For Foxconn then, this deal is great. Things are looking good, at least if it follows through on its plans. And given past behaviours, I'd caution that we'd need to see series production begin of a vehicle before we know that Foxconn is serious, because I tell you what, just Google flat screen panels, Foxconn and Wisconsin. Yeah. Why then am I about to suggest things are over for Lordstown? To put it bluntly, it's run out of time to be competitive, and I'd argue that some other startups like Canoe have as well. Side note, at the time of recording this, things are also not great for Canoe. It had a very bad piece of news this week, which makes Kate Walton Elliott very sad because she wanted a Canoe. In the EV world, as with any manufacturing industry, companies that are first to market tend to although not always, get a serious leg up on the competition, especially if they can ramp up production to high enough levels before their competition wakes up and gets into gear. And Tesla is a great example of this. As a startup, it succeeded in building compelling, exciting electric vehicles before mainstream automakers were even taking electric vehicles seriously. And even when other companies were bringing new models to market that could at least offer some kind of decent range, performance and charging capabilities without breaking the bank, Tesla was continuing to offer features that rivals didn't, like autopilot, over-the-air software updates, and a joined-up approach to electric refueling. 
Not to mention a reputation and a viral marketing strategy that literally runs circles around legacy brands. And to put it bluntly, after a company has captured a big chunk of the market, or at least set up some pretty tough expectations as to what it could offer, startups, and some extent legacy firms, have to offer something extraordinary if they're following on in order to capture the attention of buyers. This extraordinary could be a better build quality or a lower sticker price, or even the benefit of an established dealer network, or maybe just an incredible fuel efficiency. And yes, while I can't believe I'm saying this, in an established market, legacy brands that manage to produce compelling products have it easier than startups because their customers are more likely to spend money on a brand they already know and trust than a startup they don't. Reputation and dealer networks play a huge part. Which brings me to the crux of the Lordstown problem. It doesn't have anything unique, at least not that I can see. Sure, yes, it's using in-wheel motors, as is Aptera, another startup with equally big plans. But the difference is that while Aptera is using in-wheel motors for a lightweight, super-efficient two-seat, three-wheel solar electric vehicle, a vehicle which is like no other on the road today, Lordstown is using in-wheel motors for a pickup truck. A pickup truck that it's not let a single member of the automotive press ride in or drive. A pickup truck that's also from a company that has the unenviable job of dealing with a prototype catching fire within 10 miles of its facility. And a pickup from a company whose Baja race entry was withdrawn early on in the race. That's hardly an inspiring start to the company's reputation. Unlike Aptera, which has let many people ride in it, including me, and even let the Rich Rebuilds channel have a quick spin in the parking lot, to put it bluntly, one company has let people near its prototypes, while the other hasn't. Right now, there are very few other things Lordstown has told us that's cutting edge. We know a few specifications, a claimed four-wheel drivetrain capable of outputting 600 horsepower, and a solid rear axle supported by leaf springs. But that's about it. <laughs> and let's face it, while solid rear axles and leaf springs are a technology that's certainly tried and true, my old Morris Miner used to have them, they're hardly cutting edge. Especially when you consider that Lordstown's rivals, Rivian, Ford, and Chevrolet, not to mention Tesla, all use independent rear suspension to maximize available space for their respective pickup truck battery packs. What's more, we know more about the specifications of the Tesla Cybertruck and the Chevrolet Silverado than we do about the Lordstown Endurance. And according to Lordstown, it's due to enter into production in the third quarter of this year, well before the Silverado EV or Tesla Cybertruck are due to do the same. But the biggest nail in the coffin has to be the recent launch of the Ford F-150 Lightning and the overwhelmingly positive reviews that broke cover this week. The F-150 Lightning Pro starts from under 40,000 US dollars. And yes, while Ford has sold out of F-150 allocations for this year, it's undercutting the starting price of the Lordstown Endurance significantly. Although the Endurance does claim a slightly longer range for its entry level model. The Endurance is aimed primarily at fleet customers, those who will look for long-term support for their vehicles, an extensive parts catalogue, and the ability to remotely manage their vehicles using a fleet management service. Ford's F-150 Lightning already offers that, plus hundreds of dealerships who can help with larger service needs. And Lordstown has none of those things. It has no reputation to lean on, as far as we can tell, the Endurance has no unique features other than the extra unsprung mass of those in-wheel motors. Had Lordstown managed to reach its original promise and enter the market long before Ford or Rivian or Tesla or Chevrolet, it might have had a chance. But Rivian is currently tying up the lifestyle truck market. Ford is currently tying up the work truck market. And Hummer, for those with cash, is tying up a new breed of super truck electric super trucks. There's nowhere for Lordstown to go. Tesla and Chevy will enter the market with their respective electric pickups, and so too will Ram. 
and each will appeal to customers in a different way and pick up brand loyal owners because they've all got a good track record in their respective segments. So at this point, Lordstown's demise feels, well, inevitable. That's it for today. If you like the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There are links in the video description. If you want a generalized news roundup in the world of cleaner, greener, safer and smarter vehicles, please do check out our news roundup show every weekend. And don't forget that we produce videos every single day on this network for you to enjoy, ranging from deep dives and features to tutorials, unboxings and reviews. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolved Take Two, and give that bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire crew. Go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month supporters. That's Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, Dave Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leon, Andrew Martin, Guido Trajota, Brophy and the Wolf, Tazlet and the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Rory Litwin, Jim Burness, Chris Ascenter and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month patron supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley and Ian. Thanks also to the new people who've joined the team this week through Patreon and also YouTube. Yum um, may not be on the list yet, but we've had a bit of a crazy week, so hopefully you'll be understanding why your name's not there. If you would like to join the list, please know that you can do so by following the link below for Patreon or using the join button to support us on YouTube, or you can indeed show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi or our swag store. And if you are unable to support us financially, please know that just watching the video and sharing it really makes a difference to our ad revenue. And if you are already a Patreon supporter, please do double check to make sure your credit card hasn't expired. We do still have over 200 Patreon supporters with expired cards, and that's worth about $14,000 of lost annual revenue. And that means we can't do as much as we'd like, especially after this week and my wife having a pretty expensive hospital visit. So that's it. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving.